Welcome and thank you for joining this edition of DC CAP's QA Touch virtual series, QA Masterclass. Uh, today we'll be talking more about learning QA, challenges and opportunities, and innovation-inspired automation, focusing on the basics of software quality assurance, from strategies, opportunities, and challenges to automation tool selection and honing automation skills. My name is Catherine. I'm the partner manager here at DC CAP and I'll be the host for the event today. And DC CAP is the parent company of QA Touch, which is our test management software solution and what this series is based on. We also host uh, other relevant products in e-commerce and customization with Productimize, integration with our product Chloris, uh, and uh, product information management with FlexiPim. And please feel free to visit dccap.com for more information about any of our products. Uh, this is the fifth iteration of the Masterclass series. And today we do have a great lineup. We'll be featuring two amazing presenters. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Min Din from RMIT, University Vietnam. And then from Sanjay Kumar, creator of Selectors Hub and CrowPath. And we're very pleased to have them both joining us today and offering us some great insight around learning QA. Please feel free to ask any questions <clears throat> whenever you have any. Uh, you can add them in the Q&A tab um, and we'll be sure to keep track and uh, answer any by the end of the sessions. So to start us off, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Uh, Dr. Min Din is a lecturer at RMIT University of Vietnam. His job involves teaching and developing several new software engineering and IT courses for RMIT School of Science and Technology. Among many things, his background includes being a researcher and scientific workflows expert, co-authoring several milestone papers at major international conferences, and developing and promoting RCC's cloud and high performance computing, computing technologies and providing researchers with solutions in the form of the Nimrod and Kepler workflow engines. Thank you so much, Dr. Min. If you can just please come on and give us your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice introduction there. I will uh, share my screen now. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for the uh, very, very kind introduction there. And again, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Min, um, and I'm from the School of Science and Technology, uh, RMIT University here in Vietnam. Um, before RMIT, I was in Australia and I was in uh, Monash University, uh, did my PhD there and um, the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. And uh, like uh, uh, Catherine has introduced me, so my background is very much in high performance computing. Uh, but I did spend some years of my life uh, working as a software engineer. And now um, I'm a lecturer in software engineering program here in RMIT. Okay, so um, what really happened was um, about maybe eight months ago. Um, so I was looking for a, a QA platform uh, to help illustrate my course here um, in RMIT. And uh, I came across uh, QA Touch. And uh, the QA Touch um, uh, staff was very supportive. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here to, today to um, return the favors and um, you know provide some insights about what happened uh, in my class and uh, what you know, the things that I learned from, from the process and the thing that my students have learned. And hopefully we can learn uh, a thing or two from each other and um, maybe I can uh, get a few um, you know, tips and hints uh, to improve uh, the contents of my course. Okay. All right, um, so the outline for the talk is, um, I will um, talk a little bit about software quality assurance, especially about um, you know, how is it meaningful for software engineering students. Um, and then the, the, the major uh, part of the, of the talk will be about how I facilitated a, a, an authentic learning environment for teaching QA, um, teaching uh, software QA at uh, the university level. And um, I will address, uh, identify and address some um, challenges. And hopefully we can also have a bit of a, a discussion on how um, um, the, the existing, um, the, the current expectation from the industry uh, for uh, fresh um, software engineering graduates and potential for collaboration between um, um, educators like myself and um, industry um, uh, and software engineers, uh, senior software engineering out there in how to improve um, uh, you know, our, our training 
and um, and now um, capacity um, uh, building in 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 university and college. Okay, so just a few questions to to get warm up, right? Um, is it compulsory for software engineering college students to study software engineering, um, software testing, and quality assurance? Now, um, for for, for myself, right? And um, when I was a civil engineering student in Monash back in 2003, um, I, um, I I remember that civil testing and quality assurance wasn't wasn't a compulsory um, or a core subject there for civil engineering students. So um, I, I don't know about what happened now, but um, here in RMIT we have this um, QA and then civil testing course, a compulsory course uh, for the program. But back then it wasn't compulsory. Um, so if it wasn't compulsory, um, did you learn um, somewhere quality assurance when you was in college? Now, uh, I, I did not as well, so and uh, I, I regret that I didn't pick that for, for, for my elective, um, one of my electives. But, um, um, and then uh, when I got out there, I become a software engineer, I, I, I found it's very challenging uh, to, you know, like get my head right when it comes to uh, testing, especially test, testing model code. Um, so I think uh, it's, it's really something that I, 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 I learned from experience instead. So do you find the learning materials then still useful and practical? So if you did learn SQA back then, it, 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 if you did learn about super testing back then, is this still useful and practical nowadays? Is this still useful and practical for your, for your um, work um, today? Um, and finally, do we, re do we really practice what we preach? So this is um, this question is possibly more for myself. Um, every day when you come to class, I tell my student you have to spend more time doing testing. You have to write your test code and test cases before you, you start developing your your, your solution. Um, don't jump into the code and try solving problem and things like that. But do we really do that? Uh, do do we really um, you know write test code and test cases before we start um, you know, like um, developing some new user features? So um, a bit about myself. So a long time computer scientist. So I got my PhD uh, in 2013. Um, and so I've been a, a research fellow since then and an lecturer. Now, um, short time software engineer. So I did spend about three years of my life uh, working as a software engineer after I finished my bachelor degree in computer science. And, uh, and also an old time software engineer. So back then we um, we didn't have um, that many tools like I've seen nowadays. Uh, back then, we used um, things like um, C um, CVS uh, for version control. Um, we could, uh, with a framework like JWE, uh, we, we deploy our uh, web application with uh, WebSphere and things like that. And uh, nowadays, when I look out there, there's so many tools, there's so many frameworks, um, there's so many uh, different choices when it comes to CI and CD pipeline, things like that. Is, is a totally different um, landscape now. And uh, there's so many things I have to learn myself before I can actually come to class and, and um, deliver something hopefully useful, useful to my students. So my class, um, the one that I want to focus today is engineering quality assurance testing. So it's very much about software testing, to be honest. It's a third year compulsory course um, for the software engineering program here in RMIT. And we expect students to have some um, you know, programming skill in Java, um, some fundamental knowledge in software engineering um, and um, object-oriented programming, and finally, some basic computer network knowledge. And here is the syllabus. Okay, so um, I'm not so sure if this is a bit too dense uh, for a 12 weeks course um, at university level, but uh, we, I do try to cover as many topics as possible when it comes to software testing and a bit of, of a discussion on uh, software quality assurance. And uh, if you can see there on the, on the left hand side, um, topics there. So in the first half of the semester, I try to cover uh, different uh, testing activities um, like um, acceptance testing, user acceptance testing, um, unit testing, integration testing, system testing, etc. Okay, so these are the, 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 the very basic, very fundamental concepts for the students uh, before they start jumping into the um, uh, super testing part of the course in the second half of the semester. And we also try to cover as many tools as possible, as possible there on the right-hand side. So QA trust for uh, project management and test case management. 
um, Jay Behave and Cucumber for a framework like behavior driven development um, and Postman for API testing and integration testing, J Unit for unit testing, J Meter for performance testing, etc. Okay. Um, in terms of assessments, we have um, um, group work, uh, group assignment, and individual work. And the group assignment, we have uh, we split the class into a group of four to five students, um, and uh, the the work worth about sixty percent. Uh, where we have two stages there: the first stage twenty five, the second stage twenty five, and then there's ten percent for the final presentation, where student deliver their their final findings and results. And the focus then would be on the group assignment, right? So, like I said, there's two stages. Um, and we like students to be able to study the software requirement specification, uh, specification document. And from that, uh, we expect students to be able to draft and devise a test plan and test cases. Okay. And, um, and then in stage two, we expect students to, um, to um, really execute uh, the test cases that they, they devise in, in, in stage one. And the application that we focus here is a, a distributed computing application. So I'm going to talk more about that later. But here in stage one, um, uh, there's about 40 pages of um, software specification document that students have to go through. Um, descriptions of different components of, of the system and how, the, how different components uh, interact with each other. And uh, a bunch of um, user scenarios that they have, to, they have to investigate as well. And they can use that to deliver their um, there, um, you know, cucumber and and all and all JB have uh, scenarios for testing purpose. And deliverables are, uh, you know, apart from the the report, they have to uh, deliver a set of user stories and scenario and a set of test cases, uh, including integration test, system test, and UAT. Um, once they um, done with the specification, okay, I will provide them with the the complete implementations of the of the application. So there will be a bunch of um, Java source files and they will have to um, you know, start running that and, and, and execute um, uh, their test cases. And also they have to devise and, and, and deliver a, a set of uh, unit testing, um, unit test cases as well using JUnit. So to summarize, stage one, we give them, we give the students um, um, the specification text and they have to um, using the, uh, they have to use that to deliver test cases. And stage two, they now, now get to see the application. They now get to see the code. Um, they will have to then go and try to execute the test cases they have in stage one. They possibly have to you know remove many, many of them, update many of them, and add many more uh, test cases in there so that they can actually execute some sort of you know testing uh, for the application. About the application, so it's a uh, distributed computing application. So basically, it has uh, a bunch of uh, components, uh, individual and independent components that are running in parallel. So we have a bunch of sensors. Um, so th this application is called Envaro Smart. So uh, it's basically simulate a, a smartphone app um, that helps uh, people, users, to be able to detect um, the um, um, a bunch of environment um, uh, environmental um, factors like um, the air pollution, um, quality, uh, air quality, um, uh, the location where the, the user is, um, um, the, 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 alarm, um, the weather uh, with the weather alarm, and also a temperature uh, sensors as well. So there's a bunch of sensors, uh, there's a weather alarm, there's a location server that can uh, receive um, uh, live location information from the user. And then uh, all of these information is, uh, is observed by the context manager um, that will um, analyze and evaluate the sensory data and then deliver warnings to the user according to um, user references. Okay, and we have a little database there, um, a reference rep repository as well uh, to store the user references. Okay, and finally the UI. So overall, there's a bunch of um, components um, and all these components are individual and they, 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 can, they can execute it uh, by themselves um, and they can be integrated um, step by step um, as well um, to deliver the final application to the user. So when I, when I designed this uh, assessment task, this uh, group assignment task, I was thinking about how the student 
um, can um, you know uh, how how to simulate the, the integration process so student can um, jump in there and start seeing how components are working with each other um, uh, investigate um, uh, the, 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 the API between different components there and, and, and etc so we can you know like um, resonate uh, the importance of um, doing uh, unit testing yeah, so you can test different components individually integration testing and finally system testing Okay, so that was my uh, wishy-washy kind of um, idea, and um, but uh, I think it didn't uh, turn out very well. Um, so here's some some uh, student performance data. So we have um, nine groups here. So initially we have ten groups, but then one group um, some students drop out of the course. So we 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 went down to, to nine groups, um, and you can see here on the on the left hand side I have. Um, Group assignment results uh, that um, um, split into stage one, stage two, and the final presentation. Now, all the data you're seeing here are uh, um, um, not the exact value, but uh, the relative uh, percentage value, so that we can see, you know, uh, whether the certain groups are doing better or worse in certain uh, aspect. So here, um, on the left-hand side, the overall uh, assignment result. So overall, stage one was pretty okay for the students. So a few groups there got over 90, um, two groups there got over 90 uh, percent for, for, for their work. Uh, we have some groups struggle to um, understand the specifications and deliver test cases. Uh, but overall, most of them have done uh, a, a fair job and uh, got about at least you know, 60 percent. Um, the stage two, then we see a bit of a drop um, in performance there. So for groups that have done fairly well on stage one, um, they struggle a little bit to, uh, to execute all the test cases. Uh, for groups that couldn't deliver in stage one, they also struggle as well because um, they don't have so many test cases to test to, to execute, okay? Uh, apart from group A there who did very bad on stage one and did a lot better on stage two, I think that they possibly learned a fair bit uh, in the process there and they realize now they have the code in front of them, they can they can uh, deliver test cases and, and execute test cases uh, much more um, and much easier. But um, if you look into um, the stage one and stage two there, okay, so stage one, analyzing the software specification, so that's the one on the top right. Okay, so we have four components, and four main components in there. First, we require students to understand the basic concepts and techniques. So this is about understanding what it means to do system testing, what it means to do integration testing, what it means to do um, UAT testing and things like that. Now we haven't um, we haven't covered um, J unit um, unit testing in this in this stage one yet because there's no code uh, to to do unit testing. Um, so um, what we want to see in there is given the specification, given the user scenarios, how do you devise the uh, and create a test plan and test cases. So overall, there you see um, we. Um, I think now um, creating a test plan. Um, so only a few groups did well on that. Uh, a majority of them didn't do very well. So you, um, most of them only got about um, 50 to 60 percent there. And also applying appropriate testing techniques to, to the requirements, to the user requirements. Um, so that's the, the great one. So um, students didn't do very well there, especially a group 10, for example. Um, they possibly got about 50% only on that, on that part of the, of the uh, stage one. Um, come to stage two, so we look at three main components there. So again, also uh, understand basic concepts and techniques. So this is more about understanding um, how to execute test cases. Um, and also then use uh, available tools and software for executing test cases. So this part, we look uh, at how students uh, apply the tools and practices that that we have covered in the first half of the semester um, to deliver a best result for, for, for this uh, group assignment. And, um, and finally, write uh, quality project reports. So that's similar to the one on top as well. And uh, so like I said there, um, students struggle a fair bit to apply um, tools um, to, um, to execute uh, their test cases. Um, okay, so let's go a bit further there. So, um, so where's the confusion? So some of the students did fairly well on applying uh, the practices and the concepts 
uh, onto the, 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 the application and the code. Um, but some groups struggle uh, a lot when it comes to um, different parts of the uh, software testing process. So um, here is a bit of a um, you know performance data when it comes to different different um, testing phases in in the process. So we have about forty five percent of the student. Now actually, it's more like uh, forty five percent of the complaints uh, from the student uh, feedback from the student that uh, integration testing was a bit too confusing. So uh, most of the students struggle with um, identifying where to start with integration testing. Now, I think the problem here that I had was that um, the complete application was provided to the student and, um, the, and the students struggle to start picking a point where they have to um, do uh, integration and, and, and therefore integration testing. And they also struggle to uh, try to automate the integration test uh, phases as well. Um, you know, they, they were trying to uh, think about how to um, create objects and mock objects um, to um, uh, uh, um, simulate uh, the integration process. And then the, the confusion is there as well, right? So when it comes to integration, you have a top-down approach and bottom-down um, top and bottom-up approach and things like that. So that also relates to where to start and, and what to do, what to test. Um, some students also struggle with um, you know, seeing why integration need to be done. Uh, integration testing need to be done. So they, they, they said that the whole application is here, why don't we just go and, you know, do functional tests and, and use, use a certain testing and things like that. Why do we really care about, um, you know, uh, integrating, I I integrating um, you know, like a pairs of components or a couple of components together individually, okay? And uh, about 32% of the compliance was also about, um, system testing, okay? So, because I think um, we try to cover so many different system testing activities in the, in, in, in the course, you know, like performance testing, functional testing, um, um, user, usability testing, um, uh, and then when it comes to performance testing, we also have the load, load testing and then, and then uh, stress testing and things like that. Um, so the student got a bit confused as well, um, seeing what they need to include. Um, in the in the in their testing process, and finally, about uh, fifteen percent of students also got confused with UAT. I think uh, the confusion here was very much uh, about the different uh, the, the differences between UAT and system testing. Okay, so um, when it comes to functional testing, they will have test cases to demonstrate how user would be able to, um, you know, uh, different features that uh, user requirements uh, need to be tested. And, and the same set of, of um, you know, test cases can be, can be used for UAT as well, but is performed by a, a different set of users, supposedly. So, um, so the problem here is why UAT and how, how to perform UI, proper UAT without having real users here. Okay, so uh, many students struggle to do system testing and then uh, replicate that or you know, like perform something very similar for UAT again. Okay. So that was uh, my observation uh, based on the student performance. Um, at the end of the course here in RMIT, we also have, uh, we also ask students to put in um, their um, course uh, feedback, course evaluation. And um, so here are a few key points uh, from the student feedback that I got. Um, apart from um, the first one, which very much about my teaching, uh, student was pretty happy, so that's good. Um, we can see straight away that, you know, at the top column there, so there's only 50% of the student believe that the, the digital resources provided in this course have been useful for their learning. Okay, so I think a student did notice that um, they, they, need a, they need more help on, uh, on using the tools. They need more tools, especially when it comes to, um, you know, automation, testing automation. Um, they, need, they need more tools uh, to help them with integration testing. Um, some students uh, manage to do integration testing using mock and, and uh, mock the object and mock their um, uh, uh, network connections and things like that. But many, many students struggle to actually um, get through that part of the, of the testing process. Um, apart from that, students also said and think that, um, you know, um, um, they, they need more um, um, activities um, uh, to engage in, in, in the learning in this course as well. 
Okay, so from the performance, uh, student performance, uh, performance data, and from that feedback, um, overall feedback on the course, then I identify a few challenges, a few problems that I, I would like to, to, to tackle and, and improve in my um, you know, future deliveries of the course. First, attending assessment tasks. Okay, even though I think that you know, providing student a, a distributed computing applications like, that, like the EnviroSmart, um, is useful to have students to illustrate, um, you know, uh, to, to, to see um, how, why and how integration can be done and why integration testing, for example, is, is, is important. At the same time, too, I, I think I failed to actually simulate the process, the integration process there that, that need to happen, uh, that normally happen in, 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 um, in the industry, you know, in, in the real project. So maybe there's something here that you can help me to um, to um, identify and, and to improve, uh, but um, um, I think providing the student the complete application, uh, like the whole source code um, to test, and then and ask them to do integration testing, for example, is a bit overwhelming. And uh, more more simulations and, and more maybe you know um, um, uh, uh, instruction need to be given there. Okay, differentiate between various. Uh, testing phases and tools. Um, so this is also a challenge, right? So I, I mentioned before, uh, some students got confused between system testing, like functional testing and UAT. And uh, some, some students also got confused between unit testing and integration testing. So, you know, they uh, perform um, JUnit and then they mock objects um, to perform some integration, um, to test some integration between uh, different components there. And they also confused between, you know, um, doing the uh, unit testing and, and integration testing. Um, understanding the requirements to write first code, then test code, and then test cases. Okay, um, I think potentially it was a bit too overwhelming for students to go through a 40 uh, pages document and identify um, the user requirements and, um, and, and what need to be uh, tested and, 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 the, and then later write a code to test. Uh, to, to execute test cases. And also there's a, there's a, a quality problem here. So um, even though I try in, 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 the, in the design, uh, I have stage one where students have no access to the code and stage two, they have access to the code. But I still, I think there's still a quality problem here, challenge here, where students uh, always have a, a, a tendency um, to, to code, right? to see the code. Um, that reflected, um, say for example, in this, in this figure here, you know, group A there, for example, you can see that uh, in stage two, once they see the code, they can they can craft the idea about what needs to be tested uh, much better. Okay, and also there's another cognitive problems, I guess, um, everybody else, uh, every, everybody is also um, uh, fired um, challenging as well, um, is to five bucks or not to five bucks. Okay, so many students, I, I noticed that um, once they got a code in their hand, um, they start doing debugging instead of testing the code. And, um, and, uh, and also they are also try to, once they, 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 they drop, they fail some tests, um, test cases, they have the tendency to go and debug the code and try to find a bug. And some of them actually deliver some bug fixing um, in their final presentations as well. But that also you know, um, um, illustrates a, a cognitive challenge here where you know, students and also I think you know junior software engineers uh, have a tendency to 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 uh, you know, work with the code um, to, to write more code instead of you know focus on on, on testing and test cases uh, a priori. So and then I have a four more points here and they are highlighted because I have no idea how to actually tackle them at the moment. So testing the complete application. I think this the fact that I provide students with a complete application and, and the source code have a very big impact on how the, uh, the, the group assignment can be, can be um, you know, yeah, implemented. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't know how to, to deal with this yet. I mean, I, maybe I can you know, um, release a um, certain number of components uh, on, a, on a weekly basis so that students can only have uh, you know, a handful of components to test uh, before they see the whole application. But that sort of, I believe, that sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, management or that sort of configuration, you know, uh, assessment configuration is a bit 
uh, too complicated to, to coordinate. Um, and then automation testing. So it's automating the testing. So a JUnit, fairly straightforward. Some part of integration testing can also be done as well, um, um, automatically. But um, many students struggle with using things like Cucumber to, to um, um, automate um, the, the creations of user scenario and, and transcribe that into um, executable test cases. Regression testing. Okay, so this possibly related back to um, you know the, the last question that I asked before: Do we really practice what we preach? Right. So um, throughout the course, I mentioned to the students that regression testing is very important. You always have to perform regression testing uh, once you perform some modifications or you know some changes to your software design or even you know a new software uh, a new user requirement come into 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 the project. But there was no room for me to actually, um, you know, get students to, to to practice any anything to do with regression testing there. So there's no because well, this related to to the complete application things as well. So I provide them with a the complete application. There's no there's no room then for them to actually perform any regression testing. And finally, more on quality assurance. So so far, I have uh, talked and uh, discussed a fair bit about super testing. Uh, major group assessment task is also about support testing. Do we need to talk more about quality assurance? So where quality assurance in this course? Given that, to my to my belief, that the course is fairly dense already in terms of in terms of materials and activities. Okay, so this is almost at the end of my talk. Um, so those are uh, my observations, uh, my um, uh, initiative and design for my course and 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 the, the assessment. And my observations uh, throughout the course uh, using uh, student performance and their feedback. Um, so I wonder, is there anything here that we can we can is there any low hanging fruit to, uh, that we can that we can um, you know uh, attack straight away um, to improve uh, this, um, and uh, um, the course and improve the student performance and experience in such a course. Say for example, right. Um, from industry uh, point of view, you know, your expectation. So, how much software testing experience is expected here from a from a, 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 a new um, uh, software engineering graduate? What do you expect from from your um, you know, software junior software engineer uh, software engineers um, when it comes to an interview, um, for example? Also, how to increase the level of testing automation. So this one I struggle as well, and I think we can learn a thing or two uh, in, in, in the next talk today, right? Um, how do we teach software testing in the DevOps culture? Now, to be fair and to be um, to be frank, um, I have zero experience in DevOps. I mean, um, you know, um, when I was, like I said, I was an old-time software engineer. So back then, we we hardly um, practice things like Agile um, in, in our team. And um, now it's a very different landscape for me. And uh, I wonder, you know, how we can actually um, apply um, these Agile um, uh, methodologies and the DevOps culture um, 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 to, um, to uh, uh, teaching and learning super testing, okay? And a similar kind of question here, so what are the roles of our QA engineers in DevOps team? I'm pretty sure I can find this, uh, the answer to the question somewhere, but I, I just want to bring uh, some answers to the context of my talk here and, 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 my, and my course here. Um, what tools, like software testing tools, uh, do you expect um, software engineering students uh, to be familiar with uh, when they get out there and, and look for a job? Okay, so here we try to um, uh, introduce students to a range of different tools that illustrate different part of the software testing process. Um, is there anything else that is missing there? Okay. And finally, uh, opportunities for industry to intervene. Now, the reason why I, why I ask these questions is because um, when I was looking for a QA platform to, 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 to illustrate uh, my course, I, I came across QA Touch and I found it's very useful, but still some students told me that it wasn't easy for them um, to um, to navigate and, and, and to make the best out of the tool. So I hope that uh, in, in the future, there will be more opportunities for educators like myself 
um, to um, uh, be able to experience and explore uh, more uh, tools that the industries are using, and then somehow bring that into uh, into my course and you know uh, equip students with something that they can they, they, they can be comfort, comfortable with when they get out there to find job and to work as a as a software engineer. Okay, so that that's my talk uh, Q and A. Thank you for your attention. So it's Q and A now. So I hope you can answer the question that I asked um, uh, in my slide just then. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Min. Uh, yeah. We do have a, a question in our Q&A here for you that I'll, I'll pose to you right now. Okay, yes, uh, I can see it now. So yes, how can we actually you. improve the test coverage of the company products? This is, this is a tough one <laughs> um, because I, I haven't been a software engineer in, 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 in industry for some time now. And uh, it would be a question I would ask, um, you know, like the audience here, if anyone can help me to, to, to do, you know, something similar in, and, you know, as part of my course as well. So how do we actually simulate, you know, some things like, um, like this and then, and then illustrate uh, the improvements of, you know, test coverage uh, for, for real software product? Um, if I had to answer this, I would say that, um, um, do more testing and um, uh, possibly focus more on um, yeah, system testing and, and integration testing and, and make sure that uh, you do write test code and test cases before you start doing any coding. Okay. There's also one more from him. Do you emphasize on the unit testing before passing to QA? Do I emphasize on the unit testing before passing? Yes, yes. So um, is so I uh, so let me go back to my previous slides here. Okay, so yeah. So go back to my syllabus here. You can see that I started talking about um, covering acceptance testing first, uh, but then straight away I talk about unit testing. So I think it's very important for students to understand so and and so when you as well to understand that you need to test your code before anything else. So it has to start from there, um, and uh, before you before you pass, um, you know your 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 code and 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 your unit of code to someone else to test. You have to make sure that you pass your your own uh, unit testing um, uh, activities. So yes, my answer is yes, and I, I think I did try to emphasize that in a way that is not a course. Perfect. Okay. Yes, that was uh, all the questions. Uh, it looks like. Um, thank you very great. much. Thank you so much, Dr. Min. I think it was just really, really helpful to hear your insights, and we appreciate you know you going into such great detail and um, you know the, through the learning process and the challenges faced and industry expectations. It's a lot of really good information. So, thank you so much. And thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, uh, Sanjay Kumar. And he is a renowned speaker, significant contributor, and a passionate automation enthusiast. As a self-learned, self-employed individual, he runs the extra miles to make sure testers and developers' life's easy. He's an avid blogger and has written more than a dozen blogs across different media. And Sanjay, I'd like to invite you to come on board and start your presentation with us, please. Thank you, Catherine, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, Min, for the great presentation. I really love it and appreciate uh, what you're doing. It's a really good, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot today. So uh, without uh, taking further time, uh, I would like to thank all the attendees, those who are on the call and uh, really good to be here on the QA Masterclass number five and with the QA Touch. So, okay. My topic is today, Innovation Inspired Automation like how we are inspi uh, getting inspired to automation and what we are doing. I hope uh, my voice and screen is clear. Catherine, you can confirm her. it's all fine. My video uh, and screen you yes. are able to see. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So innovation, like you see in every, like we have automations in place. We are writing the scripts on a daily basis like but after sometimes what happened we became the uh, every automation becomes like tedious like a monotonous job 
like uh, you see okay we have some tools but after that like what becomes what it becomes like we are using we are doing in a, a routine job so let me take an example for this one to show you that what we are doing like we all are writing automation so uh, while writing the automation you see that we we are seeing we all are saying here that we are writing ui automation okay but i have done a lot of surveys and i found that most of us are writing the selectors i'm just taking an example here to uh, make you guys understand about the automation and how we should do the innovation so here like uh, we as a web ui automation engineer we are wasting almost like 80% of time writing the locators and we are saying that we are all our automation engineer and we are doing automation but you see here in 2020 in era of covid we have smart editors for everything but how we are writing selectors how we are writing the x bar we are still copying the value from the dom like this selecting a value copying that and then pasting and typing it is something like writing the code in notepad in 2020 where we have eclipse pycharm intellij so many editors for all the technologies for all the languages we have different different but for our ui automation engineer for our web automation engineer for our tester for our developer web developer we still writing xpath we still writing css selector like we are writing code in notepad even in 2020 and on an average how much time we are wasting on it as i said like i did a lot of we did a lot of surveys and i found that almost like 80% 70 80% time we are wasting in this and in fact like just writing one or two selectors on an average you can see here what people are saying like 5 to 10 minutes 2 to 3 minutes 1 to 2 minutes like that this much time just writing one selector and and believe me on an average if somebody is writing automation they are writing more than 50 between 50 to 100 selectors in a day imagine how much time they are putting in this thing and they are writing like manually Uh, locally we are like like a notepad to solve this problem i thought i kept giving a lot of thoughts like how can we solve this problem so that like how those people would have thought at that time like who has invented intellij who has intel, uh, invented uh, eclipse how they would have thought like okay something is there like they are writing code why don't we like while typing itself we start suggesting them something similar thought i put it here put some effort did a lot of surveys here and there and a lot of coding gone in there and introduced this new reality made this possible for the very first time a new reality build your own xpath in css selector in less than 5 seconds without compromising any learning skills with the auto suggest feature like in smart intellij and here it is the selector stuff let me show you what it does how to install uh, it's very simple you just go to selectorsub.com and you can install it that and it's available for all those browsers what it does you see like as soon as you start typing let me show you how does it is immediately like uh, like in uh, intellij when we start typing code you know that uh, like we have written something like let's say driver dot we put immediately it start suggesting you can like, from the drop down you can select that value similarly like here as soon as you start typing something your selector it start giving you the x path and css selector uh, functions accordingly whatever you are doing and this is the very first and the only innovation which does so and which made it possible let me give you a real time example for for example let's say you have installed selectors up dot selectors up and it will uh, come here as a toolbar you have installed it inspect any element here Let's say, for an example, we inspect this selectors up here. Okay, how we are doing it today? We are writing like this. You do command F here, then double forward slash A. You see, as soon as we start typing, this you should go up and down. And believe me, everybody is doing like this way. Let me just zoom in. This is everyone doing like this way. They type this, then again we'll have to inspect this element because that has gone. Now here, this selectors up looks like unique, so we will. try to type text here and you see as soon as we type something this here again gone again we'll have to inspect so these are the pain here pain points 
and we will copy this value and see there's a lot of junk space came so we'll have to make it contains test okay this is there's something wrong i missed it and okay one of three so this is the problem like we here we did a lot of thing three times we inspected just to write one element and then we copy the value typing this is something like writing the code on notepad though we have intelij let me show you same thing in selector serve you just open selector serve whatever is inspected you just start typing and see the magic as soon as you type you got the value you just open parenthesis and there you go you see we got the unique selectors within a few second you see that's it nothing we i mean you just blink your eyes and you are building your own selectors there is no more time waste no more copying the value like imagine you are copying the value from here you are typing here then you miss something a lot of time we are wasting and this is really good for those who are just to start learning things and this is going to a huge time saver and it's it supports like for example we have inspected this element you see it suggests all kinds of uh, functions and you, a beginner or expert can learn from this tool itself this tool is a like kind of expert guide expert uh, compiler debugger you can say selectors compiler basically which itself is like so much explanatory that you don't need any book you don't need any like someone to like every time you don't need a trainer every time like you if you got a stuck somewhere that whether i can use this one what to write what not to write what all functions everything every possible function it uses to just like contains dot function normalize space text contains text normalize space equal all those functions it uses to suggest it also suggest like what is not possible like with zero i mean dot is equal to if you put this one then there there will be zero matching note so you learn from here so it helps you a lot to learn about selectors and it this tool itself like previously we used to talk uh, we used to say that if you will use an expert tool or selectors tool you will lose your risk case but this selectors have changed had changed that definition itself now if you will use this tool you will become an expert while using other tools like because many people have this question like why one more tool why one more expert tool why one more new wheel so this is the region that with this tool you will become an expert while using other expert tool or whatever they have in the past you were losing their skills like because they were auto suggesting and here you are like making your own uh, own selectors so this is really amazing and there are like this is just like a very small one feature i have seen there are a lot of features here like uh, people have i mean as a beginner many times we don't know how many siblings we have i'm sure like those who are on the call none of us can say that how many siblings we have like immediate siblings we can tell but like uh, uncles daughter uh, my maternal uncles and all those people like family relatives we don't know how many siblings we have at this stage right so so similarly like here we don't i mean if somebody asks you like what all siblings are there and suppose we don't remember that we don't know what are siblings so this tool will help you to know about what are the siblings possible what are the descendants ancestors ancestor and everything you can uh, get it from there itself like you just start typing you will get them then what else selectors have made it possible which was never possible in the history let's see on this thing can we verify selectors for certain arms element it was never possible believe me it was never possible let me show you how there was no tool nothing was there where we can verify pseudodoms elements pseudodom selectors that is so even chrome dev tools was not supporting that in fact like as a beginner immediately i would never understand that this element is inside pseudodom the very first problem now somehow i got to know okay this is inside pseudodom immediately nobody would be able to know until unless they don't have a good knowledge of dom if you don't have a good knowledge of dom it will be really hard for you to identify whether this element is inside server no suppose you don't you don't know anything i don't know anything and we just started inspected this element and we started writing so we, what we will do we will write expert for this one right so let's say write and id is also there okay that i will come on that point i know so 
double powers as input you can see zero of zero it is showing so okay what we will do we will let's say use id here and we will type at the rate id is equal to this it is showing zero of zero what to do now you will be like scratching your head like um, i have written the correct x path but why it's not finding the zero of zero what to do now let's try css selector so what we will do we will write hashtag input which is an id it is showing is still zero of zero and uh, that problem is always there like you it used to scroll so this one now what to do how to solve this problem and at least like if you are not aware about shadow dom you will never be able to solve this problem in the dom with the chrome dev with the help of chrome dev tools or any tools out there in the market and it was never invented nobody solved this problem let's let selectors have made it possible selectors has made selectors have made, made it possible and see the magic now you just open selectors up immediately it tells you that this element is inside shadow dom how much time it is going to save you save for you and how people are doing it today they used to write like this they put it in their script they execute their script and see whether it's working or not and just to write one selector they are wasting almost 15 to 20 minutes of time make giving it hit and try like if it works then it's fine or otherwise try something else keep trying now you do one same thing here and you see it is telling you selectors of itself is telling you that enter css selector only as expert doesn't support spot shadow dom so it gives you the information make you an expert on that like what is possible what is not best possible whether this is an inside shadow dom or a normal element okay now you just type hash it will immediately suggest you the css selector function and made it possible for you and here you see that we are able to verify our any selectors for shadow dom elements which was never never possible and imagine like from the time when the web or xpath or this web automation was or web development was introduced from that day till date we have wasted how much time and now the selector sub is here selector sub is here which is solving this problem such a big problem it has solved and it made it possible and if you do anything wrong like double pop says input and you, if you hit enter it will tell you that invalid css selector is not doesn't support shadow dom it just gives you that information as well and this is the region that with an amount selector sub where selector sub is today this is what selector sub made it possible svg element support it has svg element support like many of us doesn't know like uh, whether what is svg in fact as a beginner we might many of us don't know that what is svg element and in fact uh, we don't know that this standard xpath format doesn't support svg element for an example if somebody has inspected this element we if if we don't have uh, much knowledge of dom we won't be able to know that this is an svg element because the svg is not there nothing svg is there right there is a path there could be one more child element of svg so if you if somebody knows that this is svg child then okay they will start writing for that but let me show you even chrome dev tools give you the wrong format of svg element if you copy this x path over here you see that zero of zero let's open selectors up let selectors help help you to learn that immediately it tells you that this is svg element and when you will start typing x path it will give you the correct format of svg elements svg child element and that there it will help you like this here you go and if you type more it will suggest more options and if it is not finding a uh, unique selectors then uh, it also helps you with the indexes like selectors of such uh, also supports indexes what you do like put your cursor in the beginning open parenthesis and there you go and make it unique such a simple thing makes life so much easy and support everything and if you do anything wrong like double power slash if you svg if you will try it will immediately tell you that invalid xpath invalid svg xpath form and makes you learn but here in dev tools it will never tell you that what is wrong or what is not you see this is wrong but so dev tools will never tell you these are the things which selectors have made it possible and the reason why everybody is loving and why it is what it is what problems it is solving it supports i frame it supports frame everything it supports like if any element will be inside uh, inside frame it will tell that that element is inside frame 
like this in frame here you can build your own x path here if any element will be inside frame then it will tell you that it is inside frame so all those it will solve it solves all those problems now the question comes like can someone tell me what's wrong in my selector like here we were writing like this selector was wrong but dev tools was not telling us right but this is wrong so let's just put uh, inspect any element here like this and when you inspect and put it will tell you that this uh, element is not correct like x, x path you type double forward slash sv and it will tell you that this is wrong x path but while what the dev tools was telling no nothing it was it was just going zero of zero like we have written let's say we have written some x path here double forward slash button and then we have written this x path by mistake suppose we have missed some uh, square bracket and we copy this here and paste it here let me make an, a small x path so that i can show you better thing let's say we have while copying we miss something here okay and we paste it here here in dev tools it will never gonna tell you that what is wrong you will think that okay something is missing i will i mean maybe this selector is not finding it is wrong i will write it again but if you paste that same thing here in selector sub it will tell you the correct error what is missing in your selector with the help of this you can solve that problem and immediately fix that issue and this is how you can you are going to save a lot of time and if you do anything wrong here it will tell you that what is allowed what is not allowed so basically it is making you perfect in writing selections if you do anything wrong it will tell you that what you are missing here like add up tag name after forward slash so it tells you that what is what wrong you are doing if you type something what is allowed what is not allowed everything it tells you and saves you a lot of time and energy and make you perfect in writing selectors up so this is the only possible solution this is the very first compiler or debugger you can say which gives you the proper error message what is missing what is not missing and what is possible security many people have this question in mind like uh, because this is a browser extension so how secure it is because many company doesn't allow let me tell you this is the most or this is the safest plugin ever built why i'm saying so because it inject the script inside your website when you open selectors up when you tell selectors up that you want to use it for this website for example let's say you have open twitter.com now whichever plugins you have installed they have already injected their script in your website but selectors up haven't done that right till now when you will open selectors up here then only it will inject its script in your website and it will start interacting with your website and working for you while other plugins believe me other plugins whatever xpath plugins you have they have already injected their script in your website so this is the region that selectors up the most secure plugin it doesn't save any user data another big region it doesn't save any user data it runs only on your local so this is the most safest plugin and there is no issue in using it and every company is making it wide tested every company is allowing and if you need anything in written from me you can take it does it slow down my computer not at all because it never inject with your script on with your website until this you doesn't allow it you don't want to use it it is the very optimized and very small in size compared to other browser plugins like it is almost like less than 2 or uh, 250 kb so this is the 100% performance there is no issue if you want to support selector hub you can share it please write blogs articles tutorial etc and this is not even 10% of the innovation a lot more on your way this is absolutely free plugin there is no license required this is absolutely for the community i am working on this plugin full time i am not working for any company i am just working for the community and how i am surviving surviving i am totally dependent on the donation and the sponsor for this plugin so i would really request like please uh, support it what are the selectors of achievement it's been like uh, 29th of july i have launched it last month and just one month it is being used in more than 80 countries it became the number one css selector tool in chrome store it start appearing in engineers linkedin profile it might be like very first innovation which have appeared in linkedin profiles in resumes of engineer within a one month of launch 
got more than 5000 downloads just in one month engineer calls it life saver innovation and it also appears in udemy automation courses and this all happened just in a month of launch of this innovation huge thanks to all the selectors of sponsors and patron supporters donors and if you need any help i would really request you to please check out the footer links at the selectors sub tab when you will open there are all the important links for all these uh, problems and uh, like whatever if you want to uh, discuss something with me any new feature request any issue you found if you are not able to use it so please check out all those links and with that my grateful heartfelt gratitude to all of you and thank you for joining and thank you for attending huge thanks to bhavani to give me this opportunity to interact with the uh, curators team and all thanks to curators team for the great uh, event today and giving me this opportunity with that thank you so much you can uh, connect me connect with me anytime on any of the social media platform and feel free to reach out to me i'm here to serve you guys with that thank you so much now i can take all the, your q and a thank you thank you so much sanjay um i'm going to come back on here it looks like we do um have a question in the chat here for you sure. someone's asking to know the difference between uh crowpath and selectors hub if you can talk a little bit about that sure 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 i just wanted to see the q and a's where are the q and a's chat yep so hi mr may i know what's the difference between crowpath and selectors hub uh sure so uh Selector Sub is completely different. Like what all features you have seen, Proper doesn't have any of these features. Like this auto suggest feature, it is the very first tool which has this uh, auto suggest feature. It is the only tool which uh, Selector Sub, which supports uh, Shadow DOM. It is like Proper doesn't support Shadow DOM. Proper doesn't uh, gives these kind of error messages. This is the only compiler. and uh, i am not working anymore on propath so you might have not seen any of the update from last three months uh, from i last i worked i left that so my uh, i mean there was like different uh, circumstances were there like that i had to leave that so you will not get any more update or any more innovation in propath from my side so the only similarity is that uh, i am the creator and innovator of both the both the tools selectors of and propath but yeah selectors of is the new reality and they are like uh, this is going to be this is going to be 100 times more power, powerful and it is uh, thank you thank you for that question okay. like yeah, because everybody has that question in mind because both are my innovations and uh, people are uh, thinking like which one is better thank you yeah, thank well, you for that good, question yeah it's always good to clarify so <laughs> yes, yeah yeah it is good yes awesome okay well, yeah it looks like those are all the questions. Well, thank you so much Sanjay for telling us more about Selectors Hub and all the great benefits and its ability to really ease the entire process. It's certainly yeah. very helpful. We thank appreciate you. you taking the time and sharing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Yeah. So another question, can you give some insight on what is coming next in Selectors Hub? So, uh yes, uh, so as I said like this is just 10% of uh, innovation and lot more coming. So, in the next release I'm working on 2.0 which is uh, which is going to be like very huge and um, a lot more is coming i can say the one new feature which is coming which is going to completely change the game of web ui automation as we all are moving towards like javascript uh, java script based uh, framework like um, like you uh, you have seen that nowadays cypress is evolving a lot many many other frameworks are coming web driver io is there like so everybody is moving towards that in that way so selectors sub in selectors sub 2.0 is something really amazing is coming which is going to complete changing the definition of selectors itself a new i would say I, i'm going to introduce a new selector for you all and which is going to which we all are uh, talking from the beginning but we never got that you will see that in 2.0 thank Again, you wen thank like you wen for your kind words yeah Well, it looks like we've got all the questions then. Thank you. Thank you guys. And if you have any question feel free to shoot out any question or anything related to automation or selectors or propath anything or xpath. Yes, great. 
Okay, well, then I guess I will just wrap it up. Uh, this, uh, you know, again, has been a great session. Thank you again to our wonderful presenters, uh, Sanjay, of course, and uh, Dr. Mindin. Uh, it was a pleasure hosting you guys and having you on today. Um, we're definitely, you know, grateful for having the important insights um, in software testing and um, hearing uh, all that you had to offer today. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Thank you, Min, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sirja, for joining and uh, having the, I mean, hosting this great session. It was really a wonderful experience. Thank you, Sanjay. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Min. Thank you, everybody. And we do have these uh, sessions every month, so be sure to keep watch on dccap.com forward slash events. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day or evening, wherever you are.